What is up, everyone? Jose Young, here with MMAfighting.com, here with another Monday edition of the A-Side live chat. Now, we're still in quarantine. We're still under this pandemic. So, as always, we're doing more on Mondays and Fridays, and we're trying to get more fighters on. So, joining us this Monday is, of course, our Monday co-host, Alex K. Lee. And the man joining the two of us needs no introduction. UFC lightweight veteran Joe Lozon, who was on time, not only on time, but early. Excellent crystal clear picture. So... 10 out of 10 hosts so far, Joe. We haven't even got any questions in. <laughs> <laughs> On time. I got good internet. We're good. I got I got to have that good internet for gaming. So. Well, well, there you go. Yeah, he was gaming before we got on. Before we get before we get into the questions, we spoke briefly on it. I know our fans are going to probably want to know, how are you dealing with quarantine life and amid this pandemic? Uh, quarantine life is not that different than like week after a bad fight life. Like for the most part, like I just you get beat up, you don't want to see anyone, you just stay in and play video games uh you're kind of cut off from the world uh pretty pretty similar for the most part I'm basically just you know staying home playing with my kids i have a bouncy house set up over to my left uh for my kids for our downstairs room so I, that's been going non-stop for like a week uh but it's good it, it's all right it's not bad what did you tell your young kids when if they ask about uh what's going on in the world right now like i'm sure they're they're like if they're not in school or they can't go hang out with friends they're probably asking like what why can't i do this so what do you tell uh, uh, a young kid like that so if Joey were here, he would give you a lesson all about the coronavirus. He's six. He's like, we have no school because there's a virus. It's called the coronavirus. It's very contagious. You have to wash your hands. Uh, so, I mean, they, they get it. I mean, they understand. Uh, you know, like, it's it's no different than them, than honestly, like a, a typical summer, right? They don't have school. They don't have whatever. Um, you know, every day he's like, do I have school tomorrow? Like, no, no school tomorrow. Probably another month or so um you know it's but but you know they understand you know kids are smarter than people you know think sometimes well they sound like they're smarter than half the world already with that <laughs> that that coronavirus lesson you gave us uh but of course this is not our show this is the fan show you guys can drop on twitter you can go on the site you can ask joe me or alex if you want to ask us any questions that'd be kind of weird but uh you can ask us any questions you want MMA or non-MMA related. I say that because Joe, we had Michael Chiesa on. We had about a thirty-minute tangent about hunting Bigfoot uh, with Michael Chiesa and Corey Sandhagen. Kind of got into a tangent on uh, crystal healing and everything. So there's no rules on the A side live chat. So Casey, our director, is in the background. Uh, everyone's favorite mustachioed hipster. Uh, excellent Stop coffee that. talk. If you haven't watched oh. <laughs> it, go go watch his coffee talk with Pat Wyman. But Casey, do you have mm -hmm. any questions up, teed up for Joe? Yes, we do. Now, uh, hold on one moment. Do, do, do. Here we go. Quote, question on the site from longtime commenter Trumbo. Question for Joe. First, just want to say I'm a huge fan of Joe, both his fights and the and the way he conducts himself. Thanks for all the amazing fights so far. Question: What's the biggest difference for you between the UFC between the UFC when you came into into it and how it is now? So, not specifically about yourself, but I guess the the promotion or organ, organization in general. What's the biggest difference? I can imagine the Reebok deal, ESPN, and so on and so forth. Was there any real thing that stands out to you that's so dramatically different that maybe fans haven't realized? Uh, to me, the biggest difference is, like, the personnel difference, right? So there's obviously different people doing different jobs, but there's, like, each person has a much more specific job. Like, when I – so I got to the UFC, uh, it was UFC 63, 2006. And at that time, Sean Shelby was designing posters – and he was the guy that was there that was basically when we signed the posters, he would like go on to the next poster, go on to the next poster, go on to the next poster. You know, like it's, um, you know, but so many people had so many different jobs. Whereas now there's so many shows that there's like, there's like 10 people on the medical team, whereas there used to just be one person, right? So it's, um, there's like each, each person is like more specialized, I think, for whatever their job is, whether it's doing media or doing this or doing that or doing media, but this particular thing or doing photos, but these particular photos. Or doing social media or doing this or that. It's just like there's a lot more personnel, which obviously it makes sense, right? You have a lot more volume, a lot more workload. You got to hire people. Like don't have, you know, 10 people do 10 different things. Have each person do one or two things. Uh, Joe, does that make things easier for you? Uh, easier, more difficult? Uh, like you said, they're more specialized now. So like you said, back then you kind of knew everyone. But now at least you know, uh, maybe you don't know everyone, but you know at least know they have specific departments for things. So easier, yeah, it, harder, it's, same? It's it's a little bit harder just because like before, like I had like personal relationships with every single person. I knew every single person. Like I knew exactly like if I had anything to do with medicals, I just asked this one person. I had anything about media, I could ask this one person. Now it's like 
it's the and the roles change like the people change all the time too so like what's going on for this show is different than what's going on for the next show or like what one person was in charge of you know for this week is different than in a year from now or whatever so it's it's a little bit different just kind of like i'm you know before it was like it was kind of easy like i knew exactly who to talk to who to go to uh now i was like i don't really know who do i you know so i just i reach out to like three or four people like who is the best person for this <laughs> at this time and figure it out but it's it's all good you know it's just that's the nature right things get bigger right? we want to be we want to be more successful it's become more successful it's gotten bigger there's more fighters there's more fights um growing pains but it's good it's really good would you say there was a certain like charm to the way it used to be or is that not the right word for it um no i mean it's still, it's still just as good i mean it, it was it was it was nicer before when you had like you had like you have stories you had background with every single person you dealt with so that part was a little bit nicer um but I think that, like, you know, kind of word just travels around. Like, I'm, I'm always been, like, since my first fight in the UFC, I've always been, like, I try to be super accommodating with the UFC. Um, you know, I, I see their point of view on a lot of things. I, you know, I understand the fighter's point of view. I understand their point of view. I understand how things have to work as a business and as a, as a show and everything else. Um, and I just, I, because I've tried to, you know, get along so well with everyone, I think that's kind of helped me. when Even when new people come in, they're like, oh, that's Joe. You know, anything he wants, just, just help him out or, or you, know, <laughs> you know, do whatever. So it works well. Has it been like you? You mentioned there's a lot more uh, specialized, there's a lot more responsibilities. That probably means you have more responsibilities during fight week too. Like when you debuted, the social media was not where it is now. Do you miss the early days where you had less to do for the UFC during fight week and you can more concentrate on the fight at hand? Uh no, I think it's better. You know, because a big part of it too is people don't realize how much media and stuff we do, and a lot of it doesn't even get used sometimes. You know, so mm -hmm. I might have like ten things and like certain clips don't get used or we do certain things that's not even used just because you have to get do so much stuff to, just to get a couple good things you gotta kind of let the, the cream rise to the top a little bit so you scoop off all the best stuff so like it's just good practice it's great practice like if, if the first time you're ever doing some kind of media thing was like when you're khabib and you're fighting for a title right then that's you know he obviously didn't have as much practice you know you want those guys to get those reps in just like anything mm -hmm. else uh so it's it's good it's good practice like it's easy. Like I am a, a super introvert. Like I would rather like not talk to anybody. Like I would have no problem. Like just like staying in my basement, playing Xbox for three months and not talk to anybody. Um, you know, but it's, it, it got me to, you know, be better, more comfortable talking to people and more comfortable, like being on camera and doing interviews. And people was like, Oh, if you, if you say something you, you don't want to come out, just let us know. We'll edit it out. I'm like, I just, I've done so many live interviews and things like that. Like I'm just, I'm not even, I'm not concerned about that whatsoever. And th this might be a weird way of phrasing it, but I spoke with BJ Penn before he fought Yaya Rodriguez, and this was one, like in the middle of one of his really long layoffs of fighting. And he said he what the fighting would come naturally, but he actually felt ring rust when speaking with the media. Like he had not done it for so long that he forgot really how to do it and how to handle himself. Is that a reality for you? Like if you take a long layoff, like you did. And then you fight on the Boston card. You're obviously going to have to do more media because you're on the Boston card and you're the hometown favorite. Do you feel any ring rust speaking with the media? Uh, not not too much. I mean, so I, I run my gym. So I'm, I'm always teaching classes. Uh, I've been running like the three to five year old class now because mm -hmm. my son's in the class. So like I run that class. So like I'm used to dealing with parents. I'm used to talking to kids all the time. And like so th that part was all pretty easy because I do it all the time uh bj is like if, if i'm an introvert bj is like a super introvert like he does not like he's not like out there doing whatever like he's he likes nothing more than just kind of <laughs> laying low and, and hanging out so um you know but i, I gotta see how that would be a little bit harder for him for sure how good your son well you said you're teaching your son that's right yeah yep uh how he's good is he? not he's so he's he, he he does it because he knows that i want him to do it right like i don't sure. i don't make him do it but he's like I want to do a good job so I don't have to do it again. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, it's all like the, the classes are half an hour. We go twice a week, uh, two or three times a week. Um, it's mostly like just playing games with them and stuff like that. It's like very little jujitsu. Like they're doing stuff that's all kind of around jujitsu, but like, um, but he has, he has funds with it. But, but a lot of the time he's like, I don't want to do this every day. Like, it's like, we do it like twice a week. Like relax. It's for, you know, we, do, we spend like an hour, an entire week doing jujitsu. Like, um, but he's, I think I think you're going to. I won't force him to do it. Like right now, I kind of like I don't force him to do it, but I I, I kind of pressure him a little bit to do it. Um, but it doesn't take a lot. It's just like, hey, you know, we have tiny to say, let's go, and, and he's good. So if he came up to you, say in a year, and goes, Dad, I don't want to do this anymore, would you be disappointed? I only asked that because I spoke with Edson Barbosa, and he his son did the same thing when it came to Muay Thai, and he was like. He said okay, but then he's like, I'm kind of heartbroken right now that my son doesn't want to do Muay Thai. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd be a little bit heartbroken about it, but like, I, I'm never gonna force him to do it, right? I'm gonna like, I'm gonna make him dip his toes in. 
I'm not going to ever make him jump in with both feet, but he's going to dip his toes in for a little bit. He's going to get some kind of exercise. Like he's small. So like my wife is, is super short. She's like four foot 10. Um, so she's, she's really short. Joey, because of all that, he, when he was born, he was six. So he had chemo and all that other stuff. So he's really mm-hmm. short too. So that, that's just like, he's probably mostly short because of her, but it didn't help with all the other stuff he had. So like, um, he's going to need to build on how to fight a little bit. He's going to have to defend himself, stick up for himself a little bit. He's not going to be a big guy. So, um, he's got to learn a little bit. Like I'll never make him, you know, like if he never wanted to compete and never wanted to do anything, I'll, I'm fine with that. But he has to at least do a little bit, you know, everyone should know how to defend themselves a little bit. It's being a proactive dad right there. Uh, I feel okay. bad. I feel bad for whoever tries to pick on his kid. Think if they you know, <laughs> if he grows like he ends up being short and is like, Haha, I'm gonna pick on this guy, and then uh, don't know what's coming to them. Casey, any, any more questions we got coming for Joe? Thank you for the question again, Trombo. Always like hearing from you. All right, here we go. From Sean Denny, Denny Rants on Twitter. This question is for Joe on Massachusetts fighting. How much influence did the likes of Mickey Ward, John L. Sullivan, Marvin Hagelin, and Rocky Marciano have on your fighting career, huge fighting spirit in that era of the U.S.? So, yes, Sean Denny uh, of Denny Rants, longtime commenter. Joe, you're from a uh, hotbed of combat sports, specifically boxing. Uh, I grew up in Providence, and I heard these names, but I didn't grow up in Massachusetts. So uh, these, these names are obviously uh, royalty when it comes to not just Massachusetts combat sports, but all combat sports, but you grew up in the hotbed. Did these fighters have any influence on you growing up? Um, not, not a ton. Like I was never like my, my dad would watch like a Tyson fight or a Holyfield fight or something like that. But like my, my family was never like super into like boxing or things like that. Um, my family was actually super against me, even training jujitsu and doing everything uh-huh. else from the beginning. Um, you know, but like, um, so our where my gym used to be. So when I when I first started training, the name of the gym was Reality Self Defense, right? And it seemed like it was a decent name for like a it was a karate school basically when it started. And then they added jujitsu, and that was when I came in. And um, but it, but so but the building was a nail factory. It used to be a nail factory like back <laughs> in the day. And Rocky Marciano was actually sponsored by the nail factory. Um, and so like he he would do workouts, he would do media workouts up in our space, right where our gym was. So that, so that part was was kind of cool. Um, but I wouldn't say that they were like a huge influence. You know, I mean, obviously like, you know, fighting spirit is obviously awesome. Um, uh, but I think it's more so like the miserable w- winters we have out here. You know, we have like, you know, brutal hot summers and then miserable winters. Like you get it. Like it's, um, you just can't get, you, you can't get comfortable. Like it's going to, no matter right. what happens. I like the cold. Okay. Well, the cold's good, but now we're going to bake you or you like the yeah. heat. Okay. We'll, we'll bake you, but then we're going to freeze you in, you know, three months later, or two weeks later. Crazy. Well, I think Joe Rogan said it the best way. When he, there's, there was an up and if you're an up and coming comedian, try to make it in Boston because everyone is miserable. So if you can make them <laughs> they laugh, need to laugh, you'll succeed. Yep. And I was like, nailed it right on the head. But like that September to like early November range, range that's the best. But then I remember when I was a kid, it snowed on Halloween once, so that could go out the window too. I remember, it's snow when you're like it was like my birthday. It was like my birthday's May 22nd. And we had like a uh, we had snow. It wasn't a lot, but we had snow. Dang, it's crazy. In uh, kindergarten, Joe, I'm, I'm up in Canada. Up I'm up in Canada, so yeah, I understand. <laughs> you, yeah you understand. Uh, well, Joe, I want. Oh, sorry, Jose, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. okay. Well, I was gonna say, you know, Mickey Ward was one of the names brought up. Most of us, I mean, for me, I'm sort of a more casual boxing fan. Of course, we know about him from The Fighter, great movie yep. that was made about him. Um, a lot of those other names in that question that was asked have had, you know, documentaries and movies made about their lives. You've had such an extensive MMA career. Do you ever think that uh, either one, you'll have a, a longer, like a full length documentary made about your career? I don't know if you keep that kind of footage. I know you had a mini documentary made a while ago. And or two, you know, if they make a movie about you someday, uh, who would play you? Uh, I, I've never thought about if they're going to play me or who would play me if they did something like that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, like we've we, we've had all kinds of, you know, people doing documentaries, and things like that, come and, you know, visited the gym and, and talked about different projects and things like that. Um, I can't talk like specifics or anything, but we've had a, a few people come in and do like, you know, film like some extensive documentary stuff like on on not just me, but the entire gym and kind of the atmosphere. Like we have like so I'm super lucky because uh, basically all the best guys in New England come to my gym every week to train. You know, so we all together get together on Saturdays. So I got, you know, Rob Font, Calvin Cater, uh, you know, really all the best guys. Devin Powell comes down from Maine. You know, we got all the best guys in New England all come to us on Saturdays. We all together. We beat the crap out of each other. We spar. Um, we, we, we show whatever, like, oh, like, you know, Nate Andrews fights in the, in the PFL or, you know, and like, you know, he's showing me guillotine stuff he likes to do and I'm showing them takedown stuff I like to do. Or I'm showing them back control stuff or like, we just all like, you know, everyone comes together and just puts everything together and, and, and gets to work out. So it's a really cool environment, you know? So we've had a, a few different people come out and, you know, try and film some stuff and, 
And, uh, you know, who, who knows if something's ever going to come of it, you know, that'll be solid. But uh, there's always interest in, in that. Just, you know, having like all the best people around all kind of come together. And, and like, I, I don't care about getting attention from my gym. I don't care about getting attention from me. I just, I want everyone around here to do really, really well. And it's just, I think it's kind of like, um, it's a little bit infectious about just trying to have everyone just help each other. You know, it's like no one's out there like, oh, well, you have to do this for me. You have to do that. It's like, just come and train, get better. That's it. Yeah. I think, Joe, I see a little bit of a Jesse Eisenberg, maybe. Does anyone else think that? With some, <laughs> That's maybe not some, bad. If he bulks up a little prosthetics, maybe. of course, a maybe. little makeup. I know. I think he'd be. Is he a Boston? No, he's not from Boston, I don't think. He's, uh, not, he's, no, not, he's, he's not from Massachusetts. He's in the Facebook movie. He, he, he parked, yes. uh, Zuckerberg for the Facebook Correct. movie. He could be yeah. the guy who plays Zuckerberg could play you in a movie. Think about that. It could work. It could work. And I wouldn't say I wouldn't say you look like Zuckerberg, so it's kind of a weird connection. But, uh, <laughs> I do I do think acting, that would be really interesting. Yeah, exactly. Acting. acting. I do think a lot would be like really interested in hearing like more about your story, Joe. And like you said, even just like kind of the guys you train with, and I bet they'd all have all kinds of stories. You trained with everyone in the New England area, so uh, yeah, that would be a very cool story. Okay, we got another question from our YouTube comments. There you Going go, right here. Can you read it? Best boxing gangster movie: Boondock Saints, The The Departed, or The Town? Ooh. Oh, I, 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 Joe, I'll let you answer this one first. You, you can't go wrong with Boondock Saints ever. <laughs> Why you, you like Boondock Saints? I like Boondock Uh-oh. Saints, but in terms of an actual movie, I do think I think The Departed is the best one. See here, okay, here's the problem I have with The Town. And I watched this movie with my dad in theaters, and he loved it until this moment, where at the end, a spoiler, like if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert right here. At the end, when they're getting ready for the big um, heist at Fenway Park, and then he walks away, and like the leaves are falling and everything, my dad was like, the leaves don't fall in Boston until October. And they're getting ready for a four-game series against the Yankees, which will never happen in October because <laughs> it's the playoffs. So my dad ruined that Looking movie for Looking into it too much. Right there. My dad ruined it for me right there. So I'm going to say The Departed. So The Departed is great. I would say The Departed yes. is probably the best overall movie of the bunch. Right, but if 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 I could choose from watching one one of the three, I would put on Boondock Saints every single time. It's like you you, you have to laugh the entire time. It's just it's yeah. so ridiculous. They shoot the cat. It's just like it's so good. <laughs> There's so many good scenes. Like the so uh, many good scenes. of those three movies, William Defoe is by far the most captivating character of, of course. all of those three. For sure. Amazing. I'll give you that. It was a firefly. It was the whole movie was awesome. The entire movie. I, I still haven't <laughs> seen the sequels. So I don't know if it holds up. Yeah. You never know when no. you need rope. You never know when you need some rope. Joe, that was not a, that was not a strong sell for people who haven't seen Boondock Saints. Uh, that, that there's a scene where someone shoots a cat. All right, there's more to the movie than that. It's, the, 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 a, the pieces don't do it against it's the, the, the product as a whole. Uh, the yeah, product but, as a whole. Uh, it's like there's there's always like so the way Boondock Saints basically goes for people who haven't seen it's about some, some guys in Boston, some brothers, and they basically get into some trouble with like the as Russian mafia or something like that, and basically it's like. Some some kind of crazy thing happens, but they never show you the crazy scene. They always show you like the aftermath first. So you mm-hmm. see the aftermath, and everyone's like, "Oh, what is going on? How did this happen? Like, what is going on? Like, guys shot up, guys covered in blood, all this other stuff." And then afterwards, it kind of it does like a flashback, and you see like the insanity of like just ridiculous about how things happened and it played out. It's just like the movie's amazing. It's so good. Uh, the I, the the I, heard, I heard the second one was kind of trash. I haven't Perfect. seen the second one, but I know Perfect. the story behind the making of the first one is also pretty out of control, like the director pitching the screenplay and everything. So if you don't know that story, that might be more interesting than the story itself because it's like – I think they should make a movie on that. So yeah. I don't want to – I, 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 I haven't seen that. I'll have, to, I'll have to go look that up. i got to see what's going on there. Because it's like – anyway. Yeah, I, think, I, think I think there's a documentary on the making of Boondock Saints. There should be. You know, I, 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 I think there is actually. That's yeah. why uh, – I'm gonna Casey, Mr. Uh, Mr. Filmmaker, what do you say? What's the best uh, Boston mob movie, gangster movie of those three? Oh, um, Casey. The Departed. There you go. Yeah, Boondock Saints though is a fun. It's a it's a That's fun. It's, 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 Boondock Saints is a fun watch for sure. Here's for sure. Here's here's another like the, the Departed has another like soft spot in my in my heart because that that like chunk in Boston history, the Red Sox win the World Series in '04. They oh, win the boy. Series in 07. Patriots go. defeated. Celtics go, win the NBA championship. This is all the 2005 to 2008 range. Gerard Mayo wins uh, Rookie of the Year for the New England Patriots. Defensive Rookie of the Year. Um, 
Matt Ryan wins Offensive Rookie of the Year. Where did he go to college? AK, that's right, Boston College. And then he gets drafted to the Falcons. The Pawtucket Red Sox win the uh, my, the International uh, AAA Championship. The Providence Bruins win the AHL Championship. And where did the departed take place, Casey? And then one movie of the year. That's right, Boston. So Boston dominated that chunk it's of time. Exhausting. It's exhausting being in Boston. <sighs> People don't realize how long our seasons are. Our seasons are Bye. always longer than everyone else's. And why did I, I why did I agree to this show? Why did I agree to this show? You, I knew what I was walking into. I knew what I was walking uh, into. AK is a big Raptors fan, and when he was on the show after that debacle of an NBA of an NBA championship parade, I'm like, I don't know what that's like because we have parades pretty much every year. So this is like okay. we have a book in City Hall to run it to run those parades. I'm not even gonna defend it. I almost died at that parade, so I'm not even I'm not even gonna defend it. I'm not even gonna be like, no, you're wrong. No, it was a debacle, and I. <laughs> Anyway, we could talk about Boston dominating no, we everything. Can't. We can't. We can't. Not? No, can't we, exactly. can we not? Can we not? Whatever. You guys got Mookie bets. You guys can have them. Anyway, what's our next question, Casey? No one has Mookie bets because there's no sports right now. <laughs> next question. Oh, what do we got? What do we got? Uh, let's go. Let's get a. Uh, here we go. Oh. Um, at the oh. side. Favorite season of the Ultimate Fighter and why? I think I know Joe's answer. Well, I, he should have two answers. I mean, besides the one he was on. We had so, the best season. You can't even argue it. You can't even great. argue it. BJ Penn, Jens Pulver's coaches, both great coaches. Uh, Nate Diaz, Manny Gimbury, and Gray Maynard, Rob Emerson, Cole Miller, me, Matt Wyman. We had an amazing season. You can't you can't even question it. I think we had the best season for sure. Um, you know, aside from our season – um, I really like the first season just because I think that no one had any idea what was going to go on. Like it's, it's there's something special about like guys that were fighting when I first started fighting, even before me, uh, because there was no there was no like long term career there, right? It was just like you were fighting because you wanted to fight. Like there was no like now there's people that are chasing paychecks and they oh they want to fight because they want the money or they want this they want that like but in the beginning it was like guys were fighting just because they wanted to fight, right? Um, same thing with the Ultimate Fighter. None of those guys had any idea what was going to come of this. You know, it could have been it could have been canceled before you know the first episode was there. Like you never knew. So, um, you know, so I thought the first season was really cool because the UFC didn't know what was going to happen. The fighters didn't know what was going to happen. The coaches didn't know what was going to happen. Like, oh, we're gonna just gonna go and train and we're gonna film everything and we're gonna see how it goes. Um, you know, they made so many mistakes because obviously the first time you do something, you don't know what you're doing. You know, they took yeah. the, they took the the, um, the fighters to like a, it was a Kid Rock concert or something, and, <laughs> and someone was having sex in the, the the toilet stall, and someone else was making fun of the person for like, and they were pulling out their phone. It just the whole entire thing was ridiculous, um, and they had no idea. They, they were doing that with no expectations of anything coming of it, just a you know hope and a prayer. But yeah, season one also had the uh, the challenges where yeah. I can't like I rewatched that where they have, where they would have like. Let's see if you could who like all the fighters team up and carry Randy Couture like on their shoulders <laughs> like it through the water. I can't believe we didn't get a serious injury after that oh, season. Oh no, they were crazy. Uh, they did, the challenge was they crazy. did the scarecrow drill, right? Yeah. They the they, they Diego, totally Diego did. climbed around someone, eighty something repetitions or something, right. and then the other team's like, all right, you know what? We, they they win. We're not gonna kill our guys. It's awesome. So I I don't I don't disagree with you. I do think five is the best in terms of like. Yeah, I, I, there's no argument for me that five is the best. I liked fourteen. I think that was Mayhem and Bisbing that had the, mm-hmm. the introductions mm-hmm. of the featherweight. So that had like Dotson, Dillashaw, Diego Brandao, Dennis Bermudez. I thought Marcus Brimish. I thought that was a pretty good representative of some elite lower weight class fights. Ten, I think, is memorable. That was the heavyweight season with Kimbo. Oh. Uh, All right, Kimbo. Fifth, that was the high. That was I the highest fifth, rated season. That was oh, yeah. the highest rated season. I liked 15. That was the live season that John Anik always was... likes to talk, likes to bring up as his favorite one. That was uh, <laughs> that Cruz sarcastic. Faber for the coaches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. One of my guys, yeah, Joe Proctor, those... was on that uh, was on that season. Yep. There you go. Yep. No, no, no love. Uh, for, no love for the debut of the strawweights. So much talent came I'm from in... there. Ooh. I think I think anytime you have like the very bottom of the. Of of the biggest guys, your your talent pool is just less, right? Because not as many guys are going to be that low, or not as many guys to be that high. Like I feel mm-hmm. like the middle weight classes are generally the more competitive, and the, you, you're just pulling from a bigger pool of people. Like more people can make 55 or 70 or 85, whereas how many guys are going to you know realistically be at you know heavyweight or you know at a lower weight class? I have a real soft spot for season six, the one right after Joe. Joe I mean, I think I agree. I think Joe's yep. uh, is probably top three. I think uh, season five, I think season ten as. Uh, 
as Jose mentioned, and season one. Uh, I like season six after, but there was uh, uh, Matt Hughes and Matt Sarah, awesome coaches. They had a great, great uh, kind of on-screen chemistry. There were some great personalities, but the talent drop-off from your season six, with, again, with respect to all the guys who compete on the Ultimate Fighter six, probably one of the worst, like, uh, as far as how much, uh, how many UFC fights the guys had after, how much success they had. It wasn't great. It wasn't great. Uh, you, were, you were, I think after you guys... We kind of started to see the cracks in the format as far as like uh, how much talent, how much unsigned talent was left out there. Yep. I think you guys might have been the last like, holy crap, there's so much, so many good guys out there who need to get in the UFC and there just wasn't that weight class, right? And then they brought all you in. Uh, so season six, I liked, but it was a bit of a drop off talent wise. And Yeah, there were still some really good guys on that season. Though. Yeah. Um, but but for sure. Matt you know, was great. The, the, there, were no, there was no 55 division until shortly before that. So like when I hmm. fought at UFC 63... That was in September of 2006. So that was like the the that was like I think me and Jens might have been the first 155 fights coming back for the yes. most part. Right? So before like, the show. Yes. So yeah. there was no there was no lightweight division at all. So they brought in a whole bunch of lightweights that who had been out there beating up everyone around the country, and because there's no division in the UFC, like we all had to you know kind of be the best of the regional shows, and then we all came together. So then second time around, you're talking 170. A lot of the guys that you know were on the season at 70, they could have made 55. So it's just. Again, just a different, different um, depth of talent for sure. I did like the comeback season yep. that Matt Sarah won. That was a big okay, that yeah. one because that to me, that I think Sarah beating GSP is still the biggest upset I've ever seen in MMA history. Considering crazy. Matt Sarah was going up because people don't talk about that he fought at lightweight and then went up to welterweight just to get a second chance and then won and knocked out GSP. To me, that's still the biggest shock I've ever seen. So that was that season four, I think. That season was four, that yeah. one was big. That one was big in my mind. Uh, Joe, I imagine you got to know everyone in the house pretty well. You guys are in there for so long and with yep. really nothing to do. Like, how absurd is it to think that uh, Nate Diaz, of all people, ever, ever, I mean, obviously he wasn't the, the star he is now. Uh, but him, I mean, really, a lot of you guys who are stars now, how crazy to think like that. But him in particular, he's so he's so volatile and so anti, it would seem like these kinds of concepts. How, like, at that time when you knew him, did, did he seem like the kind of guy who you know, was just ready to break out and did not want to be on that kind of show? Or was he, was he a lot different back then, like, as far so as you know? So I, I love Nate from the start. You know, like, Nate, Nate is, like, he's he's kind of like me where he doesn't really want to be around a lot of people. Mm -hmm. he, like, he hates doing media and stuff like that. He wants, he loves the fighting part. He doesn't want to do any other stuff. I don't mind the stuff that surrounds it, but he is very mm -hmm. much, like, against doing all that kind of stuff. So, but from the beginning, like, Nate was one of the best guys in the house, for sure. You know, he was kind of, like, he wasn't, like, an outward, like, carry the flag kind of leader. But everyone kind of gravitated around him. You know, he was kind of he was the guy that would sit in the back, and everyone would kind of gravitate around him. You know, like whereas, um, you know, Gray Maynard was on my team, and we always used to joke how Gray pissed his excellence. You know, he was the first pick. It was like Gray was the first pick. We would say that every single day. Um, you know, Gray was kind of like more of like your team captain, like your your guy that was going to lead the charge. Whereas Nate was like he was the guy that was kind of sitting in the back that everyone wanted to be around. He wasn't trying to be the the leader, but everyone wanted to be around him. And Nate was like super talented you know like his brother was doing great nick was doing great um you know nate like the very first day in the ultimate fighter like we did like the tryouts he like arm locked me like slick as could be like right away um you know and i was one of the better grapplers in the show and he effortlessly arm locked me like instantly um you know so like i'm, I'm not surprised by any of this stuff you know like and he was so big about like the running and conditioning and triathlons and ironmans and all that kind of stuff even back then he was in all that stuff so it was never like hard work wasn't you know, didn't bother him getting in a fight didn't bother him training didn't bother him um he just like he just doesn't like doing media stuff he doesn't like doing yeah. interviews he likes doing his own thing and you know he doesn't want to he doesn't understand the importance of you know of everything i'm sure he understands it more now but mm -hmm. back then he just didn't he didn't want to deal with any of that stuff he wanted to show up and punch someone in the face and, and let that be it <laughs> uh joe given that you two were two of kind of the i, I think one of the, the two of the more hype guys going to that season did you feel like you guys, I mean, it never happened, unfortunately, but did you feel like you two guys were destined to fight on the show or at least in the UFC later? Like, is that a matchup that you kind of always saw happening, it was going to happen? Um, I thought it might happen. You know, I, I, I could have seen it. Like, honestly, so Manny Gamburian is the one that beat me in the in the semifinals, right? So I made it to Final Four. Mm -hmm. Manny beat me by decision. Um, you know, and then Manny was, he was, I think he was beating Nate until his shoulder popped out, right? So I, you mm -hmm. could argue that Manny was, like, the, the best in the house, right? You could argue that. Um, but... Manny was a sleeper. Like I didn't, I didn't know who Manny was. I had no idea. I knew, I you know, I knew he was Cairo's cousin, and I, I knew he must have been a badass once I knew that. But I didn't, I didn't know who Manny was prior to the show. Like I knew who Wyman was, I knew who Cole Miller was, I knew who Nate was, um, and that was pretty much it. So, um, 
yeah, I, I thought we would probably, I would probably have to run up against Nate. You know, when we were, um, you know, so like back then, like we would basically, you know, they would have a, a fight pick and then, you know, if our team had the pick or they had the pick or whatever, and I could just tell everyone was, we were talking picks and like everyone was scared to fight Nate. No one wanted to fight <laughs> Nate. I'm like, I'll fight Nate. Like I'm, I'm okay. Like I don't, I'm, I'm, I, he might beat me, but I don't, I don't mind. I'll try and fight him. Like, I think it'll be good. Um, you know, I think that, you know, skill wise, you know, um, I think it would have been competitive, but I wasn't, I definitely wasn't scared though. Even when I got beat up, I wasn't scared to fight him. Like, you know, I was, I was all like, let me fight Nate right away. Don't let him knock off three of our guys. Let me fight Nate right away. Um, but you know, it, it didn't happen. You know, it, it won't happen at this point, I'm sure. But, uh, but Nate was one of those guys that I like Nate a lot in the house. Like I liked all the, I like pretty much all the guys in the house. Um, whether my team or the other team or whatever. Um, so it just, I, I'm, I'm able to separate things though. I think some people can't separate things. Like, you mm-hmm. know, I have no problem, you know, like I can be best friends with someone and then fight them no problem and try to break their arm and everything else. It wouldn't bother me. Do you think if, the ultimate fighter still has, I don't want, I don't know how to phrase this, but like we don't, we haven't had a season in a long time ever since kind of the introduction of the contender series. Uh, do you think it still has a home in the UFC or do you think the kind of the contender series has taken away a lot of the luster of what the ultimate fighter could have been? So the ultimate fighter is the trash TV version of the contender series. <laughs> Right. It's like I like I like to watch it, you know, like it's 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 a fun show to watch, um, you know, but it's like it's all the drama in the house and like what's going to go on and, you know, whatever else. I think the Daniel Ryan series is, is so much better because it's more about like less of a reality TV, you know, kind of trash show and more of a like a, a sporting event show. Like it's just OK, like go and do your thing, you know, train, train at home, train with, you know, the best of your ability and then come here, which is like it's almost like a minor league to the UFC. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's better. I mean, why, why go and put guys in like a completely foreign, you know, atmosphere and environment and put them on the show, which is like, it's good for TV. It's good for, for trash TV, but it's not the best training environment. Um, I was really fortunate because I had great coaches. Like I had BJ Penn as my coach and, and Rudy Valentino and Reagan and Tony D'Souza. And, and I had really, really good coaches. And I was lucky because not for whatever reason, no one else on my team wanted to work with them. Like, everyone just thought, that, like, they were going to do their own thing. Like, Wyman wanted to go and hit the bag, and Gray wanted to go and hit the bag and run, and Emerson wanted to hit the bag, and, like, no one wanted to actually train with the coaches. So I, I was spoiled. So every single day I would show up, like, what do you guys want me to do today? And I would get, like, an hour and a half private with Tony in the morning, and then i work with Reagan for an hour and a half at nighttime, and then the next day I'd work with Rudy for an hour and a half, and the next day i work with BJ for an hour and a half. Like, it just, it was awesome. Uh, and, I, and I was super lucky to get exposed to, to those guys um, and, you know, have that experience, but... Um, but I think now, like, there's a lot more, you know, trainers that are around and available. And, you know, there's all these super camps people go to and everything else. Like, I think that um, – I think it's better doing it the Dana White Contender Series way, I think, overall. That's a lesson, by the way, for all the kids out there. Use your resources and and, and coaches and things like that because uh, Joe has fought in the UFC 27 times. So uh, he's – so clearly, I, I would say a lot longer than some of the guys I think you mentioned who, who uh, you know, had good UFC careers, but uh, certainly not the longevity of you. So kids, listen to that, all right? Listen, listen to your teachers, coaches. Be a keener. Be a, be a keener like Joe. What's our next question, Casey? Thank you for the question, Seaside. <clears throat> From Corey – McGee McGeegan and apologize if I mispronounced that wrong. Hashtag the A side. If Gaethje fights Ferguson, which shouldn't even be happening and wins, how much of a shame would that fight that be for a fighter of Tony's level to never fight for a full world title? So Joe, this is in your weight class, lightweight. I'm sure you've heard a few times the Habib versus Tony Ferguson fight has fallen off once or twice. Uh, supposedly it's off again. Now the rumors are Tony Ferguson might fight Justin Gaethje as a replacement. So. Uh, to put that into perspective, Tony Ferguson hasn't lost since before women could fight in the UFC. Uh, his last fight, his last loss was pre Ronda Rousey, and now he might have to go through Justin Gaethje to fight Habib Nurmagomedov down the road. So, what do you make of this whole situation uh, in your weight class, and how much of a, sh- in, in this commenter's words, would it, would it be a shame if Tony Ferguson lost and we never got Tony Ferguson and Habib? For sure, you know, I think that, you know, the the whole rankings thing is like. It's good and it's bad, right? So it's good because it lets the casual fan kind of understand like who someone is. If they don't know, if they don't follow and they don't know who Gaethje is or who, who Tony is or whatever, like a, you can put a number, like oh number two versus number four or whatever it is. Like it just kind of puts a little perspective on it. Um, but it's a nightmare for everything else, right? It's a nightmare for everything else. Like how many people are like they're chasing to be the champ, right? They they, they want to fight for the title, they want to fight for this. Like, you know, I, I would personally rather see the UFC just get rid of all the belts altogether. 
and just pay fighters, you know, for, for their fights. Like, okay, you have this great fight. You know, like, if you keep winning fights and you keep doing well and people keep tuning in, you get paid more and more and more and more and more. Like, why do we have to have a champ? You know, like, I think it's for, because I know what it is. It's because a casual fan doesn't understand what's going on. So, they, you know, making someone a champ lets them know, okay, this person's really good. But, um, but it's so hard. Like, you know, it's just, it's really, really hard, you know. And, and the rankings just make it a mess for everything else because the number two guy doesn't want to fight the number five guy. Five always wants to fight two, but two never wants to fight five. It's just, it creates a lot of headache um, from, you know, from from managers and fighters and, and matchmakers and everything else because you can't always have two guys that are fighting someone that's better than them that someone that's higher ranked. Like, it just doesn't, mathematically, it doesn't work. If you're number two, you got to fight number one of the champ. If you fight anyone else, you're, 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 you're moving backwards. You're slipping backwards. You're fighting someone ranked lower than you. It's... It's a complaint. So yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's a shame for Tony. Like he should definitely be fighting for a world title. Um, you know, like I'm I'm a, like I said, I, I I dislike the whole idea of having champs in general. Like I understand why it's necessary, but I'd rather just see okay, like Tony's gonna fight for this and he's gonna get paid well and he's gonna do this and blah 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 and just let it go. Same thing with like when Connor comes around or whatever else. Like and there's all kinds of crazy rumors. I heard and I'm sure it's not true, but I heard something about like Connor was fighting some someone right. And Connor might be stepping in to fight something or it's just it's all crazy. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I, I don't think the fight's gonna happen. Honestly, I don't think two forty nine will happen. I know the UFC is trying to do everything they can to try to make it happen. Um I just think with all this coronavirus stuff and all these shutdowns and everything else, like they must I'm sure they have some kind of place that is um some kind of tribal land or something that someone that's willing to do the fights, but uh, I don't know. It all just seems, it seems so crazy to me. Um, you know, so Peter Barrett is one of my guys. He trains me. He's supposed to fight like, it's like a two weeks after 249. Um, or yeah, I think it's two weeks after. Um, and like, so like, but they're talking about trying to like rebook flights and things like that. And like, they don't even know where it's going to be yet. Or they haven't even told us where it's going to be yet. It's like, but like now what do we do? What do we do here? Like, am I, am I supposed to go and fly somewhere? My wife's a nurse. I get two kids at home. She's just like, it's like it's a it's a big mess, you know. I, so I I don't think anything will happen. I think that they're they're holding out to the last minute because they want to exhaust every opportunity and option. But I I don't think it's going to happen. But we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I am so glad, Joe, that you said belts don't matter. Uh, this is look. I, I I this is with respect to everyone who's won championships. Of course, it's an awesome sure. achievement. Sure. It, it certainly it certainly represents something. You know, you've reached a certain level. So I'm yep. not. You know, I I know you're not, and I'm not like crapping on anyone who no, wins no, titles. No, no, no. Yeah, of course not. But they are props. You know, and props can be useful. But they are. You're right. They are props. They they shouldn't be the be all end all of uh. You know, oh, did this fighter achieve something? Because you know, we're talking about Tony Ferguson. There's going to be. You know, when people look at the history books, like you said, the casual fan is going to say. Oh, Conor McGregor had a better lightweight career than Tony Ferguson because he won the title, which is uh, insane, which is objectively insane. Um, and, and that's what people are going to say, just because you're right, because of the weight that the company has put on titles and, and how you know fans might perceive them. But uh, I, I don't know if I'm for the abolition of titles in general, uh, but I do agree that they need to – I wish they could kind of represent them in a certain way and, and uh, not make them look a certain way. Like, Joe, when you were – like you said, you've been around since way before rankings – did you ever, you know, when you were in the UFC, did you, I'm sorry, you're in the UFC, but during that, uh, you know, your earlier days, did you ever think about, like, where am I in the rankings and where is this fight going to put me? Did that matter to you when you were, like, taking fights? It never mattered to me at all. Before I fought Pettis, he kicked me in the face, and then derailed <laughs> that real quick. But I think I was ranked, like, number four or something like that. I think that mm-hmm. was the highest I ever got. And he fought and he won the title in his next fight. Um, so, I mean, I, I got kind of close, but I never really cared about it. I never thought about it to that point. It's just, like, it's so subjective, you know, like, how how much would it suck if you're Tony Ferguson and your entire self worth is dependent on like winning that world title and you've done everything you possibly could and it's just it's taken from you it's taken from you it's just not it doesn't happen you know mm-hmm. and like one time was his fault right you could say because he tripped or whatever on the wire you could argue the wire shouldn't have been there sure. right but that was that was his fault you know mm-hmm. he, he had to pull out that time it wasn't an opponent you know like it's um but then could be pulled out because you know kidney stones or something like that it's just like it's it sucks if you try to set yourself up as like, oh, I'm a win, I'm a, I'm a success or I'm a failure based on this one thing that's not in your control. It's just not. It's not in his control. He's done everything he could. He's won all. He's won all these fights. He's beat all these guys. How could he not have fought for a title by now? But he hasn't. So it's just, um, it's unfortunate, you know. But and again, I, I agree. With you. I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not trying to take away from titles or anything else. Mm-hmm. I would. I would personally like to see almost like a, um, almost like a seasonal championship or something sure. like that. Okay, you know what I mean? Like. Who who won the you know who won the 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 summer 2020 title? Who won the December yeah. 2020 title? You know something more like that. Same as like anything else like you know football or whatever else. Like you have like you have like a season. 
You have a season, you have a champ. You have a season and a champ. You know, like it's um, maybe do at the end of the year, maybe do it December. Okay, maybe just do like one title fight a year for each division or so. I, I don't, I don't know how you do it, but um, but something along those lines would be better because that way, like when Khabib, when he's he's the champ, but he but he's if he's not gonna fight, you know, next week, then like someone else can get that title. Like I understand, you know, not to take away from Khabib, you don't want to take away, but like at the same time, anytime that someone is a champ and they can't fight, they're they're denying someone else the opportunity to to contend for that title. You know, mm-hmm. if the Patriots won the Super Bowl last year. And you know they can't, you know they gotta, they can't, you know they don't make it this year. You can't say, oh well, you know that's not gonna happen this year because, you know, like well they can't be here, so no one can win the the, the, the cup. Whatever. So uh, it sounds like you like the PFL format. Um, a, a, a little bit. I mean, I, I don't like, I don't like how they structure and they organize, the um, like the contracts. I think it's hmm. like it should be a little bit more set on. What you're gonna get paid should should step up a little bit more considerably. Um, like I, I think those guys are kind of screwed right now, right? Because like they're I think they canceled that entire season now, right? So those guys are all locked in for a season. Yeah, it's it's all been postponed. And then now they, um, I think that there's something in the contract that says like they, you know, you're you're locked at this price for this season, but like next season could be different. So if this is postponed or whatever, like what's that gonna mean for the contracts? Like I don't like that aspect of it. Um, and, and I and I don't like the the timing of it all, right? So like you're 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 struck to, you're stuck to like a rigid structure on when you're gonna fight. Whereas the UFC is more so like if you can't fight in this fight, you just we put in the next card or whatever. Uh, oh, someone says, ask yeah. Joe if you. Oh, uh, quick question uh, from Casey. Uh, ask oh, I can Joe. Ask right. I'm right here, but uh, oh, go ahead. Casey. No, I, uh, no, I was actually interested, Joe. You talked about two forty nine. Um, I mean, outside of the just insane travel restrictions that are going on right now and are probably going to be increased as the weeks go on, would you yourself take a fight right now? Or Like if the UFC goes, hey, can you fight on 250 or 249 with all the training limitations and travel limitations and just the health crisis going on in the world, would you would you take a fight if offered right now? Um, no, I don't think I would take a fight that fast. I mean, like it's it's kind of because it, it, it's kind of irresponsible, right? It's kind of irresponsible because so my wife, my wife's a nurse, so she's 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 seeing like the 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 bad stuff that's happening, right? She's seeing all the stuff that's going on. Um, you know, like we're if we go to like we go to like my gym, we come out, we're like you're purling everything, and you know don't, she doesn't want me going anywhere, right? And, and that's fine. That's why I've been I've been home. I haven't been going anywhere. Um, it's kind of irresponsible if I want to go and, um, you know, try and fight somewhere and like, you know, ask all my coaches, okay, can you all go and can you come with me and can you get all exposed to everything? And then can you bring it all back to all your families and, and all the people that you're going to come in contact with? Like the people I would see, even, even as the introvert I am, uh, just with the UFC staff, it's like, you're going to see a ton of people, you know, like, and then, you know, I, I think it's a little bit irresponsible. You know, if, if I were going to do something, you know, I'm a, I'm in a little bit different case because I could maybe like, okay, I'd be like, okay, well. I would get like my brother or someone to come and stay with my wife and help with the kids. And I would basically go and I have to like find like a hotel or something for like two weeks or something and just stay away from everyone. So I don't, you know, bring whatever I encounter back. It's just the whole entire thing is really, is kind of, you know, unfortunate. It's a really bad timing. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's it, the, the whole situation sucks and it sucks for the fighters. It sucks for everyone, you know, cause I know that all the fighters, they're not getting the best possible training, you know? Um, you know, Calvin Cater is supposed to be fighting Jeremy Stevens at 249, right? So Calvin's one of my guys. He, he trains with us. Um, you know, Calvin's doing everything he can. I'm sure Jeremy Stevens is doing everything he can. But I can guarantee you, you're not going to see the best Calvin Cater against the best Jeremy Stevens. It's just, it's mm-hmm. not going to, it's not going to be the case. You know, like, are they are both going to be ready to fight? 100%. You give them, either one of those guys, 10 minutes notice with no camp, they would be ready to fight, for sure. Um, but, you know, and, and they would put on a great fight. But it's still not the same. It's not the same as having, like, a full camp. So, like, I, I, I would, uh, it's 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 kind of good and it's bad for the UFC because right now there's no competition, right? So there's like anyone that's going to that's gonna tune in, like anyone that's bo- sitting on board, if, if there's a UFC on, there's a live fight, they're going to they're gonna watch that. They're going to find it. And they're not going to all go to their friend's house and watch the fight. They're going to sit at home and they're going to watch it. So your buy rates are going to be, you know, even higher because of that. Um, it's it's kind of like a golden opportunity for the UFC to kind of go in there and take advantage and, and you know, make the best of the situation. Uh, but it's 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 a hard it's a hard it's a hard call it's a really nasty situation. I mean, you you said your wife is a nurse. Um, a big concern of mine I've been kind of talking about is if they have it in the United States. I mean, these are fist fights, and eventually someone will get hurt and will need medical attention. Do you think it's like like you said, it's kind of s- selfish 
to put medical resources into, you know, um, voluntary um, price fighting right now? Um, I mean, t- to some extent, I mean, like, it's a little different, right? Because I think the big, the big shortages is not necessarily like, it, it's of course, it's going to be beds and things like that. But if someone's going to the hospital, they're going for stitches or something more than likely, right? It's generally not that big of a deal. Um, you don't need, you know, the, the personal protective equipment is like a big, big deal. Um, that's like, I think it's something that no one's really paying attention to. Like that's a much, much bigger deal than people realize. Um, you know, so like, you know, me going in with for stitches is not going to affect that. It's not going to affect, like, I'm not going to need a ventilator. You know, like there's, there's, there's very like real concerns, uh, for all the hospitals and, and all the healthcare stuff that is like, I understand that. Yeah. It's taking some resources away, but it's not taking a ton of resources away. It's not taking like those critical, you know, but at the same time, if the, if the system is stressed as is like, why add any undue stress? But the whole thing just sucks. Agree. <laughs> just a very bad situation everywhere. That's to put yep. it to put it bluntly, it sucks a lot. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the question, Corey. Uh, excellent question. Do, do, do. Here we go. I think that's like seven weeks in a row we've had a Habib Tony question. So I don't think it's anything. Hey, you go another one. <laughs> gonna keep from, coming. Not gonna yeah. <laughs> from Alerve eight eighty one on Twitter. I believe that a combo of Connor versus Justin and Tony v Habib, Habib does more than Connor v Habib. Do you agree? You also then have a potential third fight money of any connotation of winners and losers if you go with the first two fights. So I think he's saying like a combination of Connor versus Justin Gaethje and Tony versus Habib. Is it on like the same card or like kind of a mini tournament style? I I don't really know. I think he's he's saying saying same card. Yeah, I think he's saying same card. So like, you know, Connor and Justin is the co-main and then Tony and Habib is the main event. Yeah, I, I definitely think that does better. Than Connor and Khabib, right? You know, we've already seen Connor and Khabib. You know, like you know, there's. I would love to see it again, but we've already seen it once. You know, like I would, I would be super excited to see Connor versus Justin Gaethje, and then of course we, all, of course we all want to see Tony and Khabib. So yeah, I, I think it would definitely do better. And and of course there's there's potential of a third fight, you know, based on you know the winners. You know, like almost like a mini tournament, you know, a main event, co-main event, and then the winners fight each other next card. I think that would be awesome. I would I would tune in for that for sure. Everyone would tune in for that. I think um, it would make. See, it makes the most sense. I don't know if Dana White wants to put Con- Conor McGregor in a Coleman in a re- th- three-round fight. That's the only. That's going to be the only hiccup. Oh, I assume they meant he was the main event. I assume they meant the key. They would. They would break the rules. Put and Conor make- over the title. I'm not even. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. I honestly think they that's can what do. They, would they can do anything they want. If they want. If they want to have a five-round fight as a Coleman event, they can do that. They can do anything <laughs> yep. they want. Like you know, like it's it's the the commissions have like rough rule sets, but. If the UFC wants to do anything, they're going to let them do whatever they want. They're going to change the rounds, do this, do that. Like They can do whatever they want for the most part. Uh, I just want to say, I think that question was phrased in such a confusing way because <laughs> they knew Joe would be on the show, and Joe is smart. And we are not. I think if <laughs> I think if we had had another, like if there was no, if it was just me and Jose, they would have made it more clear, like or they're yeah. just not asked at all because we wouldn't have been able to figure it out. Sure. So thankfully Joe is here, and I'll just say on that that I don't think uh, Connor should ever be put uh, unless you're doing one of those New York supercars, like three title fight cards or whatever. But even that, I always think that's a waste. I always feel like if you're gonna have Connor headline a show, that's the time to put lesser draws uh, on the undercard because it's gonna draw, it's gonna do big money no matter what. So Joe's right though. For the fans, of course, it'd be awesome to have those two fights in the same card. But I do wonder sometimes for the UFC if it's better to to space these things apart. E- even though it's it's a nice to have that feather in their cap to say like, oh, we did three mega fights on one card. But business wise, that never made sense to me. It's good at variety. It's good to it's good to switch it up and not do the same thing mm-hmm. every single time. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Thank you for the question, Elerv Eight. Thank you for that, Matt. That word problem. <laughs> oh, all right. from, oh, sorry, I sorry, asked question. that one. From Trombo, Dillashaw, do you think TJ should, as he says, get an immediate title shot after coming off a two-year suspension for doping? So, yes, I don't know if either of you heard, but TJ Dillashaw recently came out and said the UFC is targeting an immediate title fight for him when it, his suspension is up. So I'll start with the fighter on the show. Uh, what You've already made your feelings known on it, how you feel about the actual championships, but we do live in a world where championships are... Uh, important in the eyes of fans in the UFC and a lot of fighters. So do you think TJ should get an immediate title shot after his two-year suspension? Hell no. I think any, anyone that's caught doping, honestly, I, I think that with a combat sport thing, like it should it should kind of depend a little bit on what you get caught with, right? So if you get caught with something that's, like a, um, that's not as big of a deal, then maybe, okay, it's not as big of a penalty. But if you're getting caught, what do you get caught with? EPO. EPO, right? That's a pretty big deal. That's a big deal. That's like hardcore. That's not like a tainted supplement. That's like a big deal. I, I, I think it should be like a lifetime ban or something like that or some kind of, you know, like that's how I feel about things. Like I don't buy the whole like, oh, he didn't know. Or like, there's, 
contamination things that can happen. Like, uh, Elijah is getting caught with Austrian. Um, like, I know, like, so Tom Lawler is one of my good friends. And he's, like, he's, like, the most anti-supplement guy ever. He lived with me for a long time. He's, like, he doesn't take, eat supplements. But Tom will also go dumpster dive and eat cookies out of a, out of a dumpster, no problem. Like, you give him anything, he, he'll be like, oh, hey, take this. He'll take a bite of it. You know what I mean? So, like, I could see him 100%. Like, someone's like, oh, try this new flavor drink I had. And him taking a swig and not thinking about it at all. And that's probably what happened with Tom, right? And he got it with, like, a two-year ban. And then the UFC kept him on the contract, and then they then they cut him as soon as it was over. Like so, like you know, in that situation, like that, I think Tom got kind of screwed a little bit, right? It's just like it was unfortunate set of circumstances with, with Usada and things like that. Um, but if you're doing EPO, like you know exactly what you're doing. You're cheating. You're straight up cheating. You're punching someone harder. You're in better shape. You know sort of stuff. I do not. I, I would. I would rather see like a, like maybe not say a lifetime ban on everyone right off the bat, but like anyone that's caught multiple times like see you later you're, you're out of here joe, that's like joe, a big deal. joe can you Not explain like, for our fans what epo is because i don't think a lot of people understand the difference between what say uh, a tainted so, supplement versus epo so epo is basically uh it, it's it, it basically it makes your blood thicker right and you basically get like superhuman cardio like you just go forever that's what lance armstrong was doing epo so basically like they i think they take your blood that they treat it and they put it back in i think um it's i i don't follow super close but it's like it's not like a, oh I, I took a shake and like there was a little bit extra in it or something that wasn't supposed to be there. It's like you know exactly what you're doing. That's not like an accident. Um, you know, accidental stuff I can see like it, it could happen. You know, like I could I, I remember I used to go to like I'd go to like Jamba Juice or whatever and I get like a, a a milkshake or a smoothie or something. Like oh you want protein? I'm like yeah sure. They put in the protein right. That could test positive for something. There could be something that protein that they're just buying whatever and it's just like some like generic like BS brand and I could I could get flagged by Usada for that. And, you know, so obviously you got to be a little bit smarter and like things like that can happen. I understand. I should have been, you know, you should be paying closer attention to what's going on, but something like that could happen. And you could say that's like, that was like a harmless or a stupid mistake or whatever. It's different when they're taking your blood, spinning it up, adding shit to it and putting it back in. And there's just, it's a whole different, a whole different level. Uh, I just want to say first that uh, I said earlier, make sure to listen to Joe's advice. Do not listen to Tom Lawler's lifestyle, apparently, of no. eating cookies out of no. – don't do anything. Tom, Tom Lawler, a very entertaining guy, great fighter, uh, great pro wrestler. Uh, do not take any of his advice, uh, life advice. Uh, so, that's, so Tom, Tom, that's strictly for <laughs> – So Tom lived with me for a while, a couple years, and we used to go up lifting together, right? So we went up, like, went up lifting, we're coming back, and we'd stop at like McDonald's on the way back at like a uh, ham, egg, and cheese or something like that, right, from McDonald's. And – so we're driving, uh, we're driving his car, and his car was like he had just. It was like when he had first moved, uh, moved up here. So he drove from Florida with his girlfriend and their cat. So like the car is like disgusting, right? Filthy Tom Lawler, right? It's, it follows him. So we're, we we go to McDonald's, and Tom he doesn't want to combine. He doesn't want to eat two full McMuffins. He wants to take the top off of one and the bottom off the other and combine them into like a super McMuffin, right? Well, like he's driving though, so he does the, the most Tom Lawler thing ever. He drops it on the floor. I'm like, oh that's a waste like that's that egg's gone he's like bullshit that's gone <laughs> it's like cat hair and sand and like dude puts it on together and eats the entire thing like tom tom there's so many nasty stories about tom eating stuff <laughs> just getting started he earned uh, his, he earned his nickname dude, <laughs> filthy. Filthy. live the gimmick live the yeah. gimmick live the gimmick he says <laughs> so are, are you are you are you a fan of um filthy tom lawler's pro wrestling side yeah, so like so Tom Tom is uh like I said he, he lived with me for a long time I've known Tom forever uh yeah he's 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 got a way better personality for for pro wrestling like you know all the entrances he's done for the UFC and everything else you know like he was he should have been a pro wrestler from the start. Thanks for the question, Trumbo. I know we're running up on time, but I'm sure we have more questions, right, Casey? Yeah, yeah we, we do. Right. Oops, oh, sorry, I asked that one. That was one that made no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I understood. I understood that one. <laughs> From Suzanne Fights. Suzanna Fights, another longtime commenter. Is it possible Habib had to leave U.S. because his visa was expiring? Lots of countries have 90-day limits for visas, and I think he was training in AKA since the start of the year. So with that top 90 days, end of March, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what Habib's visa situation is outside. I, I, I doubt anyone knows outside of his inner circle. I doubt it. I doubt that. I doubt that was the case. You know, he's he's got a big fight coming up. Like that doesn't come up by by surprise. Like that's like this is. I think it was more of like a coronavirus thing that you know they got out. Like mm -hmm. they they put California on lockdown. Everyone had to you know basically couldn't leave your house, um, couldn't go to the gym, couldn't do this stuff. I'm, I'm sure it was more that than uh, a visa issue. I'm sure. Oh, Joe and Jose, so naive. Have you not been hearing what our fans and what the <laughs> beloved troll, the beloved trolls of? 
I think, as we know now, I specialize in speaking troll. I did it last week with uh, I translated some troll comments for Lima last week, and uh, I, I'm happy to be the troll. Uh, Khabib was scared, as we all know, an <laughs> undefeated an undefeated UFC fighter was too scared to fight Tony Ferguson because you know Tony Ferguson is El Kukui, very scary. I wouldn't want to fight a guy named El Kukui. So uh, this visa, whatever, if it is a visa thing, no, that's all BS or, or whatever he said to the UFC that they said he no, that's all a lie. He didn't want to fight Tony. Come on, guys, we all we all know this. What I, I thought this was understood. And, and no, I was yes. trolling sure. the underground since I was in high school. <laughs> I used to go in the underground all the time. Wow. I set up my own form so I could post as any person I wanted. I was the first troll. Not the first troll but I was one of the original trolls. Uh, did you have, I don't did get, you have like, troll accounts? Of course. No, I, I had better. I, I, I basically I made a form. I, I legit did this. I made a form because because I'm a computer science dork, right? Mm -hmm, so sure. I made a form where if I plugged in like the thread ID and then I could drop in anyone's user ID and I could post as them. So I would get two different people that weren't even me, and I would get them arguing with each other, and then they would pick up the conversation because they would think they couldn't forget they they forgot about the comment or whatever, and they would start fighting. Like it was <laughs> awesome. I could I could pull the I could do it. You're yeah. a madman. This is you <laughs> are a madman. Yeah. He he helped build the current culture of uh, uh, online <laughs> MMA fans that we see today. This is the guy. It used to be. It used to be submissionfighting.com, and it was the underground. It was there's wow. so many names, but yeah, I, I had it all down. Yeah, you Piece were one game. of the first fighters I noticed to be active on RMMA, too. So he's the head of that game, too. I love Reddit. Yep. I love Reddit. <laughs> wow. Wow. Now we see the real man. So there, this there, this whole internet boom is nothing is not a surprise for Joe Lozon. No. Oh, he's not. on top of it. And I, don't, and I don't get trolled by people. Like, I understand if people are like, they're trying to troll me. I just block them. I just move on. Like, I don't, I don't buy the, um, no, nah, it doesn't matter. I, there's a lot of crap going on. Doesn't matter. Do you block fellow fighters? Oh uh, no, I mean no one's like I, I don't really I don't really have a reason to block anyone. Like I've had like I think there's been times in the past where like certain fighters were like you know harassing me nonstop about trying to fight. Like I think like like so Gilbert Burns is pretty vocal about stuff. So mm -hmm. he's, he wants to fight anybody at any time. So like there was a while where he was like calling me out nonstop. So I think I, I blocked and muted him or something uh, for a little bit. But like no, I don't, I don't care. It's it's just like. We get so many mentions and, and things like that, like all the time, and notifications that, like, you know, when someone's just being like super annoying, it's easier to just block them. Don't even respond to them. It, it takes you seconds to block them and just at least eliminate that annoying notification. Uh, but there's really no reason to block anyone for the most part, unless they're just going out of their way to be annoying, and then you block them and move on. There you go. That's it. Any more questions, Casey? Yeah, one last question before we go to our promos. Hold on one moment. Do, do, Thank do, you, do. Suzanne. She was wondering why, like, all of a sudden we're on three days a week. She's like, is it always the same <laughs> time and everything? So thanks for – from Mark Kasbrat. Uh -oh. <laughs> WrestleMania thoughts? Joe, did you watch WrestleMania this weekend? I didn't. We're going to have to do another question. We, we can't, this can't be the last one. we get another question. Uh -huh. we have it. Any more questions, Casey? Oh, no, let, me, let, me look at, let me look at the um, YouTube comments. Uh, hold on. So huh? I, I don't – I used to watch uh, like WWE and, and all that stuff like back. Like when I first started training, that's how I got into it because me and all my friends get together. We watch like WrestleMania and all this other stuff, and then we'd end up on my trampoline in the backyard trying to murder each other and choke slam and power bomb and everything else. Um, but I haven't I haven't watched it in like forever, probably since I was like sixteen or seventeen years old. It's been a long time. Joe, what do you think about what do you think about the fact that they're even like still holding events? So I don't know if you know, but uh, they sort of they sort of filmed uh, WrestleMania this this year actually ahead of time. Uh, WWE has their own. They have their own performance center in Orlando where they can kind of okay. do all this stuff. So I mean, what do you think of that? Because it's still uh, yes, obviously you know they kind of had a small crew. They made the crew as small as possible. There's no audience. Uh, you know, uh, we've been very. I know a lot of us in the media have been very critical of the UFC, kind of still wanting to push forward with events. What do you think? Like hearing about again, like WWE holding events, some MMA promotions still overseas holding events. Uh, Chel Sonnen just did some Mission Underground and like a missile silo or something. <laughs> what do you think about everyone kind of push trying to push forward still, um, despite all this stuff? Um, I think it's. I think overall it's kind of irresponsible, but I understand at the same time. You know, if you're if you're the WWE and you can get 20 people together and you can have like or 30 people or 40 people together and you can have like this big like cornerstone event, mm -hmm. then I think as a, as an organization, you know, maybe there's there's too much money involved there. To, to not do that, right? It's like if it's your biggest thing, it's tradition, all this sort of stuff. Like maybe it, it's worth doing it in that situation, right? Uh, but doing everything scaled down and, and, and limiting as much as possible and all this sort of stuff. Um, when the UFC was talking about, you know, trying to make Tony <laughs> Khabib 
like, oh, it's Tony Khabib. They've done it five, you know, they tried to make this four or five times before. Like, of course they got to try and press on. You know, once that fight was off the table, I thought they were going to scrap the whole entire thing. Like, it's okay. Mm. Like, I even heard they were going to do just that one fight. Right. And, th- and that makes, I would, be, I would be in favor of that. Like, okay, do just the two of them. <laughs> There'd be 10 or 15 people there, you know, corners and a couple officials and judges, whatever. Like, um, once that fight wasn't going to happen, then like, okay, maybe you, maybe you step it back a little, maybe, maybe you delay it and put it off. Um, so like, I, I, I understand the business side of it, but it's just, it's the same in WrestleMania. You, you, you can't tell me they didn't do great numbers. Was it, uh, Saturday night, Sunday night, whatever it was, it was, it was, it was two, a two night. night so two night normally it was two supposed to be, it was supposed to be in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers stadium in front of like 70,000 people. Uh, and it was going to be a one night, like seven hour show. But then they split it up between two and two, and they basically pre-taped everything. They even pre-taped multiple finishes to stop spoilers from people coming in. They even have, I don't know if you That's saw cool. this, but they had they had two matches that were filmed off-site as movies. They had, like, full yeah. scores <laughs> and everything, like multiple That's camera shots. Awesome. And so <laughs> it's it's easily, it might not, it, I think it's going to do great numbers because, like you said, no one has anything to do. It was the only thing yep. on. It was two days and it is by far going to be one of the most memorable when, WrestleMania. When did I've they film seen. it? How long ago did they film it? Like two oh, weeks ago. Like two, right, two three yeah, weeks so ago. Yeah, so it wasn't, things weren't that bad two weeks ago. It was starting to like, that's the big thing too, is like, it's like the time of everything, right? So like 249 is going to be like, they're saying that's going to, at least around New England, that's going to be like the peak. Like that's when we're going to be dealing with the worst, you know, for New York, Massachusetts, mm. all this other stuff. Like that's when the peak is going to be. Like obviously like our peak is different than the peak of everywhere else, but um you know, it just it's just it just seems like it's it's not a very good time. Like if they did a show two weeks ago, three weeks ago, sure, go for it. Like I thought it was fine. They did the Brazil card, you know, like it was kind of like it was before it was down there. It was mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. crazy yet, um, but now it's it's getting a little crazy. So I, I think it's you know, um, you know, but I don't know. I'm just a fighter. <laughs> well, <laughs> we've been I, I've been notified we're I've been notified we're out of questions. So no, Joe, no, no, we, got, we got we got one more got very one more? important one. one oh, more. do we? Very important one. Here we go. Here we go. Hard, of, hard course. Of, of course. Of course. Know anything about it? Yeah. Right favorite there, quarantine ah. snack from Amy Wee. So yes, we've asked a lot of fighters this. What's your favorite snack during quarantine time? Favorite quarantine snack. I've been crushing Oreos. Double Ooh. snacks. Like I don't I don't eat a lot of snacks when it's not. Like I don't I don't buy snacks for me. It's my kids. Like mm-hmm. my son Joe be like, Dada, I got you an Oreo because I love you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I'll, he'll give me two or three Oreos and then he'll come back. I was like, I got you another Oreo. I got you another Oreo. Before you know it, I've had twelve Oreos and like I'm not hating on it. I'm not gonna correct him and tell him to stop doing it. But it's I don't have to go get him. I just I sit here and he'll bring me Oreos. What's your technique, Joe? You, are you, you dipping milk? Do you just go straight? Do you oh, try, break it apart? I mean, that's the real. D- that's depends the real how involved you want to get. So usually it's just whole Oreo right in the mouth. Do it nice and easy. If 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 I'm if I want to get a little more elaborate, I'm gonna set things out. I'm gonna make a special night. I'm, I'm dunking the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. Get a dunk. But I'm not. I'm not a twister. I think you just you go you go right. as it is. Don't mess around. So you're saying if you come back, you'll be heavyweight Joe Lozon? <laughs> I eat like a fat kid all the time. Like I can't, I can't gain weight. I cannot gain weight. Like I'm like 100, and, I'm probably like 171 pounds or something like that. Like I'm the heaviest I've been in my life is I got up to 178, and that was because I was like lifting like a maniac and I was eating on top of it, like eating pasta nonstop. But uh, I can't get like I have to really, really struggle to to eat that, you know, to gain that much weight or, or you know whatever. So I can't. I'll be 172 pounds when quarantine gets over, and I'll be 172 pounds when it started. It doesn't doesn't change. <laughs> Living the dream. Well, that's our last question, right, Casey? Uh, yes, sir. Well, as always, the guest of honor gets to cut a promo on whatever they want. Joe, you can plug, you can talk, you can say whatever. It doesn't even have to be MMA related. You can basically, the floor is yours for the next few minutes if you want it. All right. Uh, thank you for checking this out. Appreciate you guys coming in. Make sure you keep chunk of the A-sides. Go on what, Monday, Wednesday, Friday right now? Monday, Wednesday, Friday during quarantine times. Monday, Wednesday, times. Friday. Quarantine days. Uh, yeah, no. If you're local, you know, come come check out my gym. We've lost a ton of people during the quarantine, uh, so we we can have lots of mat space. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep that going. My gym's in Easton, Massachusetts. It's LozonMMA.com. Um, but yeah, no. But you know, thank you guys for having me. Anytime, man. Well, have you, if, depending on how long this quarantine goes, we'll have to have you back. I mean, dude, I'm back. I'm yeah, down. Yeah. Down. Definitely. Guess is you're early. Good internet connection. Right. Good answers. Good you're clearly smarter you guys than us. Appreciate, it, but I got a good microphone right here. I got a. Oh, up. we don't don't think we didn't notice. Yeah, <laughs> don't think we didn't notice he's that. the original troll. Let's not forget that. It. He's well Ready. versed in, in uh, trolling. Ready. Whatever you guys there need. You go. You. Well, thank you so much, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, for AK.
That's Casey, everyone's favorite mustachioed hipster. That was Joe. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google, YouTube, all the fun stuff. But until Wednesday, we're out. Bye, guys.